Hi everyone, welcome back to Emergency Chaos where we talk about tips and tricks for ER nurses. So today we will be going over how to perform a cardiac assessment specifically for new grads in the ER. So why is it important that we are good with our assessments? Well, essentially we're trying to rule out or look for diseases that are deadly, right? So differentiating patients who are sick versus not sick. Therefore, your assessment skills are very important because you're busy, you have many things to do, and you need to figure out who deserves your time the most, aka prioritization, right? So the goal is to be quick and concise. You should eventually get to the point where you are in and out of a room in five minutes. But of course, in this time, you will be finding out if your patient is sick. And if they are sick, you will be devoting more time today. So one thing that I do want to note is that uh, the cardiac and respiratory assessment go hand in hand, but today we're just going to focus on the cardiac, as the cardiac aspect of it. And then on the next video, we're going to focus on the respiratory aspect of it and kind of tie it together. So what is the main question that we are trying to answer with the cardiac assessment? The answer lies with what is the role of the heart, right? So here with the cardiac assessment we are trying to figure out if there's adequate perfusion happening for the body the first part of the cardiac assessment is the visual assessment otherwise known as the first or initial impression i like to call it the visual vital signs it just sounds a little more fun for me so here we simply look at the patient and determine if they look sick do they look sick right so the things that we need to be looking out for and keeping in mind are like things like mottled skin diaphoresis do they look pale do they look altered? And things like, are they slouching in a weird position? Do they seem like they're guarding? And then some f f obvious things like, is EMS already bagging them when they're walking through those doors, right? One thing that you should keep in mind is that EMS will give you some type of report, right? It can be very thorough or very limited. It can perhaps guide you in, direct in the right direction. However, as I mentioned, what if the report is limited? It's gonna be up to you to figure out what is going on with the patient. So as we've discussed in prior videos, while the patient is being connected onto the monitor where you're gonna get your vital signs like a blood pressure, a heart rate, and SpO2, you're going to have to multitask. You may be doing all of this by yourself or with the help of others, but don't let it scare you. Know that the more you do it, the better and faster you'll be. Just keep in mind that nothing in life Nothing good in life comes easy. So the more you do this, the better you'll, you'll get. So simple, if the patient is awake, it's, it's great, right? We're gonna gather our, our information from them. So sometimes I personally find that just by simply asking the patient, what brings you to the ER today? Or how can we help? Most patients are gonna provide all the information that we need. But there are some times when we may have to guide the patient towards the important things. So we're going to begin by asking the A and O questions, the alert, the alert and oriented questions like, what is your name? What year is it? Where are you? And again, what brought you to the hospital? These essentially tell you that the patient is having adequate perfusion to the brain at this moment in time and is able to think and recall. So next, you'll want to ask about the specifics. For example, since we're doing a cardiac assessment, we're going to ask, what does, does your chest hurt? Or we'll also want to ask, do you feel any pressure or any palpitation? Since in the past, I have found that some patients don't consider pressure in their chest to be pain. So you have to ask specifically about pressure. And then also, you may have to specifically ask about palpitations as some patients may not may not bring it up even if they are having it instead of palpitations you can say something like is do you feel like your heart is racing because some patients may not know what palpitation is so further questions you need to ask is um when did your chest pain start right what were you doing when it started were you up and about doing activities or were you resting or were you eating or did the pain wake you up from your sleep and then ask, where is your pain exactly? Does it radiate anywhere? Does it go to your shoulders perhaps, to your arms, it's to the left side or the right side? Does the chest pain go all the way to your back? Does it travel up to the neck or the jaw? And then things like, what makes it worse? Does activity make it worse? What makes it better? Does resting make it better? And then you'll want to ask if the pain is consistent at all times. And if it does 
come and go so which one is it consistent or does it come and go and then another thing that you should ask which is sometimes very helpful is if this pain has happened in the past before and how did it go away and perhaps if they did seek medical help what were they told since if this pain is very similar to the previous one and they seek medical help what were they told and that information can help us can guide us as to what we're uh, dealing with and looking for next you should go into some of the associated symptoms like dizziness are they feeling dizzy are they feeling short of breath are they feeling nauseous have they vomited at all are they feeling increasingly weak and all of these sort of point to perhaps a cardiac etiology and that's why they're associated symptoms next we should go into the medical problems and the medications that they currently take for example ask about uh, are they on blood thinners are they taking any blood pressure medications on a regular basis do they take aspirin on a daily basis do they have a history of having prior heart attacks um, so essentially the more the more risk factors that the patient has the greater likelihood that something serious is happening right and if they've had previous heart attacks and you know that they're likely to have another one again right and then another important thing to keep at the back of your mind is that diabetic patients and uh, females can sometimes present with non-specific symptoms or discomfort when they are having a heart attack right so in these patients you should consider at least doing an ekg right so the next thing you should be asking about is what about drug use drugs like cocaine and meth can cause chest pain from how hard they're making the heart work right so it's important to ask doesn't matter what your patient you're not judging anybody by how they look you ask anybody that's having chest pain hey do you do any drugs because if they do the treatment for this chest pain can defer right All right so next we're going to be going in deeper into the cardiac assessment Okay, so now let's go into assessing a patient who perhaps can speak back to us, whether it is because they are comatose, altered, or in such severe distress that speaking is clearly out of the picture. Once you've ruled out all the basic fundamental ER things like ensuring symptoms aren't related to hypoglycemia and perhaps an opioid overdose, you'll go into the specifics of a cardiac assessment. So once again, we're going to start with our initial impression. How sick does the patient look? And while the patient is being connected onto the monitor, you're, you're going to assess their skin color, noting important things like cyanosis, paleness, diaphoresis, and mottled skin. You'll look for obvious signs of edema, noting if it is bilateral or unilateral, as bilateral tends to be a heart issue, while unilateral can be a venous issue, issue like a DVT, right? So take a quick look also at their JVD, also known as the jugular venous distension, as it is a poor man's way of assessing CVP or the patient if the patient is in fluid overload. Another thing that we're going to go into is assessing cab refill in all extremities and more importantly look at their pulses and assess their pulses one thing that you should keep in the back of your mind is that a bp of around 70 is needed for a carotid and femoral pulse right so if you can feel it when you're palpating it then you know the patient's blood pressure is at least 70 or more the radial pulse needs approximately a blood pressure an sbp of 80 and then the pedal pulses need an sbp of 100 so if you can feel a radio pulse, you know that the patient's blood pressure is at least 80 or above. This is useful if the patient is not yet on the cardiac monitor. Once your patient is on the monitor, you can get important information like blood pressure, heart rate, SpO2, and a cardiac rhythm. I always like to repeat my patient's blood pressure right off the bat, even if the first one is great, specifically if the patient looks sick. There's been plenty of times when the first blood pressure was great but someone repeats it for whatever reason and it comes back shitty over shitty so if the blood so if the patient is tacky with the low blood pressure you know that there's a some type of shock occurring and the heart rate is because the body is trying to compensate so having the rhythm on the monitor is also helpful because you can quickly see if your patient is in svt or afib rvr or even in vtac right so this brings me to another very important point which is that you need to obtain an ecg within 15 minutes or of patient arrival or it should at least be among the top things to do on your to-do list because an ecg can show an mi it can show arrhythmias clearly and it can even give clues as to if a patient is having a pulmonary embolism 
Thankfully, though, this is one of the things that you can delegate to uh, somebody else if you have the help. So as always, don't forget to listen. Keep it simple. Are the heart is the heart or the heart sounds loud and clear or are they distant or are they irregular do you hear any extra hard sounds like s3 s4 or any murmurs and then further assessments that can be performed at the bedside include a, a bedside echocardiogram which is usually going to be performed by your er provider and it can show things like ejection fraction which is the percentage of blood that leaves the left ventricle it can also show the right ventricle size with which if it's bigger and dilated, it can be a telltale sign that something is going on in the lungs. The IVC or the inferior vena cava will show signs of fluid deficits if when the examiner compresses it and it collapses. And it can show other things like a pericardial effusion and then among other stuff, right? And as far as history, if the patient cannot provide it, you'll do the best you can. You'll obtain it from family, from friends, from EMS, or do a chart review if the patient has been at your fa uh, your facility. Here, I just wanted to name some of the deadly things that we are going to be watching out for, right? So these include things like the uh, everything ACS related, pericardial effusions, a thoracic aortic aneurysm, pulmonary embolisms, tension pneumos, essentially everything that's included in acls which is you know svt bradycardia blogs vfib vtag all of those we're going to be watching out for chf exacerbations uh hypertensive crisis and there is much more um still but these are the some of the basic ones that we need to keep an eye out for so after your assessment you're going to know how sick your patient is and if needed you're going to devote as much time as possible to stabilizing them and performing the workup after the assessment to ensure we find out what is going on and that we begin to treat it. So some final thoughts though, is that I am gonna be making more future videos, but that's gonna take time, right? So you need to be studying and searching things up at home. You need to familiarize yourself with the basics. So of course, the more you see and experience the better, but that's not the excuse that's not an excuse for not going the extra mile because the last thing you want is to be at work, being in the room, having your patient and not knowing what is going on, right? So at least if you take the time to understand the basics, you'll be better off, right? So on another note, let's learn from others, right? Listen to the questions that they ask and how they perform their assessments and ask if you can't think of the reason for why they did something or how they did something right don't be shy because again the more you know and experience the better you are going to be as a nurse and the more capable you'll be of taking care of your patients so guys thank you for listening to the video and as always teamwork makes the dream work guys teamwork makes the dream work